Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Prime Talk. Today, I'm excited to have a special guest. Today, I'm having David Story. David is the founder and CEO of Amazon FBA Built to Sell, also known as AFBTS. Uh, AFBTS is a unique coaching program for Amazon sellers to build their business and make it optimized for sale. Okay, so the way it's constructed is, you know, it's ready to be sold in a snap, in a beat, and also ready to be sold in really the most uh, valuable position uh, uh, possible. He's going to share more with us about, about that later on. But uh, in the meantime, David, welcome to the show. Hi, Oni. Good to be here. Pleasure, pleasure to have you. So uh, today's episode is going to be all about the story of David's story. Um, and you're going to share with us, uh, you know, who are you, where are you from, where did you grow up, how did you begin yeah, yeah. your professional career until we end up to where you're doing today. So I guess uh, without further ado, let's just jump, jump right into it. Yeah, start right from the beginning. Got it. Okay, so, so I was born in uh, Northern England in the UK, and I pretty much lived there all my life. I've done a lot of traveling, but I've just if lived... If I'm not mistaken, it was Liverpool? No, it was Newcastle. Newcastle, sorry, yeah, yeah. 50 Liverpool's miles... Liverpool's on the west, right? Yeah. 50, 50 miles south of the Scottish border, right right in the north of England. Um, beautiful place. One of the most beautiful places in, in England, yeah. Castles and beaches and lush things to do and see. It's good. good, good you, live, live. you live in a castle or no? No, no. <laughs> yet, huh? <laughs> but uh, the, the the castle just up the the road it was uh, where um, oh, what's his name Harry Potter was filmed there. I'm oh, uh, not kidding. The that's castle, cool. the, the broomstick cool. scene. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so so that's where I was born. Um, and uh, my father and grandfather. The grandfather was a um, inventor. Um, father was an engineer, and I kind of followed in their footsteps and. I always knew I wanted to be an engineer, so I went through school. I didn't do uh, like the, what you call the A-levels in England. I went straight to college. I knew exactly what I wanted to do, which was engineering. So I went and got my um, qualifications in engineering degree. And where'd you and go I to uni, a, university? <clears throat> university in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. So stayed local, yeah. Did a degree in manufacturing systems. So it wasn't That's a straight solid. mechanical engineering. So, yeah, I want to touch a little bit, if you may, if I may, uh, your your father and grandfather. So, what kind of products were they designing, or what kind yeah, of inventions were they working on? They're, they're both farmers. My, my granddad used to design um, like uh, devices for making jobs easier on the farm. I think he's got a patent on a special system for mixing uh, and taking particles out of grain, you know, grains. Yeah. So he designed this special thing, got patented the mixer, on that. Yeah. To, to relief, I guess, to, yeah, to pull apart the parts of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the big invention, invention in America back in the old days was the cotton gin, right? When you pick out the, the cotton, uh, you know, seeds, they, they're very thorny. And without the gin, they were able to throw it all into this machine and, you know, roll it with their hands and the cotton gin take, took out the cotton with the good part and the bad part. And they were able to really scale production and also prevent uh, all this, all the scratches yeah. and, and the cuts and bruises that uh, yeah, yeah. people used to get, something yeah. like that. So that was kind of the the design there to make sure that to, to scale up the ability to uh, separate the grains from all these uh, components. Mm -hmm. Got yeah. it. And your father, what kind of stuff did he work on? Also in farming. Yeah, he was a farmer. And then uh, when I was about when I was born, they sold the farm. And his dad decided to be an engineer. And what year did he sell the farm? Just to have some context. Why did what he? Year? No, what year did he sell the farm? Uh, 1970, the year before I was born, 1973. Uh, so you were growing up, he wasn't a farmer anymore. It wasn't, wasn't uh, farming, yeah, it was more I, into engineering. Yeah. Farmer. I lived on the farm because mm -hmm. I lived in the big farmhouse, but uh, he wasn't a farmer anymore. Got it. Super unique. You know, uh, you know, 100 years ago, farming was probably the largest industry. But, you right. know, bounced 100 years afterwards, it seems like such a niche industry to be in, right? Because yeah. uh, you got e-commerce, you got, as we were part of, <laughs> And you got uh, high tech, uh, you know, writing code and computers, and uh, just an abundance of other uh, industries that grew up uh, mm -hmm. since the uh, burst of uh, you know the technological improvements mm -hmm. of the past century. All right, so University of Newcastle. Uh, what year did you graduate? Uh, 1998, I think it was 1998. 1998, yeah, you graduated, right. and what's your next station? So it was what three-year college or so five? I had year? a year out. I had a year out in a company, a German company. This is, Which this one? Called Draeger. They manufacture breathing apparatus for firemen, divers, Ministry, Ministry of Defense, 
uh, in the UK, and then the big headquarters in Germany do all. How do you call? How do you pronounce? How, how do you spell the J? J what? D R A E G E R. Draeger. Draeger, got it. But you'll see the names in hospitals because they manufacture uh, breathing devices and incubators and the really high top wow. end quality face masks and full to do full hazmat suits and everything to do. So that. when you dive and then I, I I have a scuba diving license. So when you have, you know, you need to stay like, I guess, for three minutes under the five meter realm to decompress, yeah. right? Because you have the, the, what do you call that? Uh, nitro? You got to balance out the, the yeah. oxygen. So if you don't do that, you can get like a, a natural poisoning and you got to go to the special decompressing pressure. That's what they manufacture. That's what they do in Germany. I, I didn't work on that equipment. Mine was uh, the, for the uh, firemen, firefighters. I was concentrating. Got it, got it. Uh, cool stuff. This is super, super high level stuff though. Yeah. So I had the year out there and then I got my degree. Then they rang me up. I was, on my, I was on my way on holiday and they rang me up and said, David, do you want a job? So I, so I had a job straight away when I got back from holiday and uh -huh. I just started working for, for But them. you were working in the UK or in England or you had to go to working Germany? in the that? UK. And so, you imagine the equipment um, it has to be of the highest quality because if it goes wrong, someone could die. Oh, yeah. Fire, fire, could die. It's so, critical, yeah. It's critical. Uh, yeah, you know, absolutely machine. critical. So the process, it was very process driven, um, very high attention to detail um really using the best techniques the best equipment to come up with some just fantastic designs so i really loved it there That's started great. as a product designer um designing the the, the face masks and the uh, the regulators all the backpack all the systems all the hosing and you know everything that goes with it loved it and back in the day what year was that when you start working there that would be 1998 1998, yeah. yeah, when you as soon as you graduated, and yeah. back then you were designing all these procedures, what manually with uh, sketches, or you're already using software and, and, and uh, computer design? Uh, we, 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 we had, a, I'm not a very good graphic designer, but I'm a good engineer in terms of uh, 3D CAD, so I had 3D CAD. Mm -hmm. So the, the graphic designers would sketch up stuff, then I'll put it into the 3D CAD, and then would make prototype models and would test them in the labs where I had all testing facilities, big cages. In the dark, we used to crawl through and smoke fill the, all the equipment on, test wow. all the usability. So I came up with some good pattern, pattern design, designs, nice. uh, my own unique things. Like I've got a patented a, a firefight. So firefighters, when they're climbing up ladders, imagine it's hard, the tight shoulder straps. So I made a, a special device that allows the shoulders to move with like a swivel point at the back. Guys, so stay flexible, yeah. So yeah, their, their ability to climb yeah. and use the shoulders is, is as if they're not even carrying anything, correct? Yeah. That's cool. And it was all yours or you had a whole team around this? That design the was patent. mine. That one, yeah. yeah. That pattern is on your name for looking to the record. It says David's yeah. story. Yeah. I've got ah, respect. Much respect. <laughs> very, very cool. All right. So how many years did you stay with uh, Jaeger? Uh, it'd be seven, eight, possibly eight or nine years. Yeah. So I advanced into a, a di different role. I advanced into a senior engineer. So I was running a design team. And then as I was leaving, I created the whole new I went into projects, created a whole new project management system in the in the company, mm -hmm. um, nice. and then I decided okay. to leave in uh, about which year? Well, it'll be two thousand and seven. Two thousand seven, close yeah. to nine years in the mix. Yeah. You leave. What was your next station? Next, I went to a company that manufactures designs and manufactures uh, deep sea robots (ROVs). Robotically Deep operated sea vehicles. robots, ROVs. So you've seen them, they go down to 3,000 meters, 5,000 feet. Yeah, tremendous pressure, yeah. right? Uh, bar, they pressure, call it bars, yeah, right? With um, big manipulator arms and lots of lights and cameras. And you say three jobs. kilometers, it's uh, basically 30 bar, right? Underneath uh, the sea level. Every, every, bar. every. Uh, 300 bar. 300 bar. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Every 10 meters is a bar, so 300 bars. Yeah. That's super, oh, yeah. super uh, condensed. Uh, yeah. So it gets super dark and uh, all right. So you had to build that technology to to create these vehicles and the robots. Yeah. And what was the main purposes for the robots, as far as you remember? It was just uh, the, finding that Titanic for, or um, the, the exploration of oil. So it, it oh. did like opening up like big oil fields. But I wasn't an engineer this time. I was a project manager. Started as a project manager, working on projects, and uh, excelled quite rapidly through that company because it was a different sort of company. Remember, I was very process driven, process led. This was a sort of new, sort of unique company that had been just built up by some engineers. So I excelled really well and um, I took on some massive projects. I took on the world's largest ROV contract. 
supplying uh, 30 ROVs to Brazil. But to, uh, uh, what's it called over there, the oil company they have there? Uh, what do you call that? Petrobras. Yeah, Petrobras. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Petrobras. Yeah, Petrobras. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so, so these ROV systems—they're not just an ROV. They come with um, many different uh, parts that go with them, ranging from a million pounds would be the cheapest one up to sort of ten million pounds just for one system. Wow. Really big, big ones. Really. So how big expensive. was that contract? Thirty vehicles with all the parts and components. How big was it? Hundreds of millions. Over no, a billion. Fifty million. Because there's these million, uh, pounds. Yeah. Systems. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Now, how long? How fast did you have to? How, uh, did you have to deliver it? Or execute on this two years two years got a satiric contract yeah. wow all right very very cool um yeah. all right and what's the name of the firm or the company you're working for that was smd 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 so it stands for soil machine dynamics because they originally started making uh machines that that deep sea plows plowing trenches in the ground and laying cables laying yeah the, the fiber active label across the atlantic yeah yeah we're still doing that but they, yeah, either get, they either get towed by ships or they go under their own uh, propels. So. How deep does it go, those cables? Uh, also three, four, five kilometers? How, what's yeah, some, some four, yeah. Yeah, so think about it, guys. We're, we're probably having this you know, on the cross-Atlantic. You and I, we're having this uh, recording on Zoom. <laughs> we're using the fiber optic uh, infrastructure, which David really has had the privilege of being a part of that industry. We all take it for granted, but underneath the Atlantic, they're sitting like, Miles yes. and tens of miles, I don't even know, oh, of, of yeah. massive, massive cables, which has, you know, because there's corrosion, there's a lot of things. So they create so many cables inside there because they know already that there's going to be parts of it that will pretty much going to be yeah. not usable over the years, but they keep on laying more and more tracks, right, over the yeah, years so, to, just so, to keep so it running. The, the front blade cuts like cuts a really deep trench, you know, four, three or four feet deep, and the cable gets laid in, in, the, in the center, and then there's a backfill plow that fills the trench back in over the top of it it's amazing yeah so they're actually using the grounds of the atlantic ocean to cover and protect these cables yeah. as uh, and under the rock wow it's, it's uh, pretty wild and based on all this you know we're having these amazing technological abilities called you know the internet the cloud you name it we have it and the world is just uh, becoming a smaller village mm -hmm. uh so it's pretty cool all right so uh smd right soil machine yeah. Dy dynamics dynamics uh how long you were there I was there about the same time, maybe a bit longer, actually 10, 10 to 11 years there. Nice. Yeah. And you also progressed. Yeah, I enjoyed uh, that. Excelled. Any yeah. patterns there as well or no? No, because I wasn't designing. I, I was, yeah. I was were, managing. So I went from project management to head of projects, big project. So I managed the whole project team. Let me ask you this differently. But, Underneath you and the teams you were managing or the, 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 the engineers you were managing, the, any patterns they created on your realm, under your realm or no? But over the years? Lo loads. But the, oh, were, were really uh, if you had to put a number on it, dozens, tens of, <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. They, they were making new stuff all the time because uh, they had to solve unique problems, that, that these massive contracts. So, yeah, so I eventually ended up as the operations director of that film, that, that, that firm. So, I was yeah, running, and it's based out of Newcastle big, also? Yeah, running a big factory. Uh, so, I really enjoyed that. So, I had underneath me, I had quality team um the projects team uh supply chain um business improvement uh engineering and manufacturing that's amazing yeah, yeah. so as far as i can see you know high level engineering long long long-term relationship and contracts with you know the clients mm -hmm. everything is very very well crafted it has a long-term vision it's not spontaneous not not for now it's everything is you know it's high level stuff as far as i can see it uh you know with your experience so far with uh Drager, but also um uh, SMD, so it's uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty impressive. Plus, you have the, your own patent underneath it, underneath many many patents. So, uh, even though you're you know looking to the future with all these projects, constant innovation is taking place underneath uh, the mm -hmm. surface. Uh, also, underneath the surface, cables are being laid across the Atlantic, kind <laughs> uh, kind of the side hustle for you guys. All right, so uh, so you spent all these years there. Uh, any other special project you want to mention besides the the Petrobras uh, project, <clears throat> the 50 million pound? Uh, no, there's, there was lots of big projects, but that was probably the biggest. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Anything uh, revolves uh, with the U.S., United States? Anything? Any special companies from the U.S. You remember? You can recall? Not that company, but uh, the first company I did a, a tour of all of the east and western side of the states, including Alaska. I think I had eleven flights in eight and days. What was the mission there? What was the purpose of that? I was showing off the breathing apparatus. 
I, I designed a new, uh -huh. and I took my team with me and we were showing all the firefighters and we had firefighters in Miami crawling under like desks and things or testing it all out. Then we were up to Detroit and across Minneapolis and over to Alaska and they're all testing it out. And, and they're That's in the awesome. snow in yeah, Alaska I, and it was... I, I, I tell you one thing, in the United States, they really make it cool to be a firefighter. You know, if you ask a lot of kids, they want to be firefighters because yeah. there's a whole culture here behind it. You know, I, I'm originally born and raised in Israel. We don't have that kind of culture about the firefighters. You know, yeah, yeah. we have them, but they're not that of a symbol, not much of a symbol. But here in America, they're a great symbol. And you, uh, if you're able to excite them, that means you're, you know, super cool, super cool stuff because they're exciting yeah. to begin with. All the stuff and gadgets that they have is always impressive. They go to the schools, and you know, I know my kids. They go to school. They have firefighters that come in once a year. With all the tools and this and that and the truck and they show the whole thing and they get they get them really excited mm -hmm. that's pretty awesome all right so uh let's talk about your next station after um so machine direct direct you said dynamics sorry so machine dynamics yeah so i always knew it. my plan when i when i was 18 was i was gonna start my own company someday and i planned to go out in, in industry probably till i was about maybe 28 29 i, th I thought I, I thought i would do that and then start my own company, but I was enjoying it so much that I stayed a lot longer than what I was planning to. So anyway, it got to the point in Soil Machine Dynamics where it was when the oil prices crashed and lots of the contracts went Why was that? Why was that? Remind me. Oh, that was... Uh, about two, 17, 2018? No, 2014. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so okay, the, price, the oil prices uh, dropped. Okay. Yeah, the oil prices crashed and the, the, lots of the contracts ran dry and we weren't getting much work. So they were having to make uh, cutbacks and lay people off and it just wasn't exciting to work there anymore. And I saw my way out. Uh, Got it. Yeah, it's, it's worth mentioning that, you know, the oil business or the energy business is cyclical. It comes with cycles. You have the yeah, boom and bust, right. boom and bust. So you had the great, you know, turn of the boom when you entered. And yeah. as the bust came in, you felt, you know what? You yourself survived. The others suffered, but it was probably yeah. uh, you know uh, the time for you to I guess explore um, something that you were interested. Uh, even from the get-go, you mentioned you always had that in mind, doing something of your own. So you, you saw that as an opening, as an opportunity to, yeah. to do something on your own. Yeah. Yeah. So I left. I took. I went straight off the cliff. Just walked up straight <laughs> off the cliff. I left, and I was sitting one Monday morning in the back of my bedroom, thinking, "What have I done?" <laughs> what have I done but I'm gonna do it I'm gonna do it I just thought I, I, I'm just gonna do this and my idea at the time was to create because my my passions in um product development I also got a master I didn't mention that I got a master's degree in product development when I was at my first company very useful um, these days very yeah, useful. so I thought I'm gonna create some unique brand new design that's what I've always wanted to do I don't know what's going to be yet something so I was starting to come up with ideas and things like that. And I bumped into this guy that I used to know. And he, he uh, called me in, into his office. He was at the company. And he said, uh, David, he says, uh, he says, I'm quite busy. He says, um, he says, I've got to go to a meeting. He, says, he, was, he was flustered. And he says, here's a, um, a password and a login. He says, uh, he says what for? And he says, Amazon. He says, Amazon? He says, yes, <laughs> Amazon. I said, oh, okay. So, <laughs> so I went back home and it was, uh, it was, uh, Hold on, let me get this straight. This is after you resigned, after you left your company. Yeah, after I resigned, it was just. You a go and visit your friend. What he he was he was working somewhere else. It was his own business. Yeah. Well, what's the name? Of, what's yeah, the name of the friend? Let's give him a shout out. It seems like uh, he, he's the one who brought e-commerce into your doorstep. Yeah, he, right. he was, yeah. So what's yeah. his name? Steve. Steve what? Steve Shoulder. Steve Shoulder. What he was at work, uh, or was his own business, or we're working for another company? We came to visit his office. No, he he was working for another company, and he bought um amazing selling machine too uh, an email shot and he bought it and he was he tried to do it but he didn't have time to do it so he said there's a password and a login dave so i went home that night typed in the, the password it was uh, and i had matt clark from uh amazing selling machine in front of me and i was just absolutely hooked i couldn't stop watching it and, <laughs> and, and which uh, what year was this when this happened 214 214 yeah uh, so you were uh, at uh, S uh, SMD what from two seventeen yeah, to two fourteen? That was at the SMD till, till then, yeah. So it's about seven years, yeah. Two seventeen to two fourteen. Yeah, That's about seven, seven years. years. Yeah. Guys, so two fourteen. Steve, uh, you know, reaches out. He did the uh, amazing cell machine ASM. You run back to him that night. You see the <laughs> content and you were hooked, yeah. Yeah, I was hooked. I couldn't stop uh, watching it. Talk about e-commerce knocking in your door. That's a I didn't big get job. much sleep, and I uh, knew. I knew when I saw that it was product based and I could see the, the system behind it, 
I knew that that was for me. So I just went to go and see him a few days later and I said, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so just shook handshake, on it. And, handshake, yeah. wow. Okay, so you handshake it where you guys went to business, what, partnership, 50-50, or something like that? Yeah, yeah. And what, what was, okay, what transpired then? I mean, what was no, the... Well, he, he'd, already, he'd already got a product, well, two products. One one was, a, the first one was a, like a pressure gauge for um, um, automobiles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and for cars, was, automobiles, a pressure gauge. What for the tires or something? Yeah, for the tires. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So that was his uh, first or second product that he launched. That was his first product. Yeah, and uh, it was and it, it, it was doing all right. There wasn't that much demand for that sort of product at the time. Mm-hmm. And then he. And this is Amazon second, US, Amazon UK, both. Amazon, Amazon US at, at, at first, and then he brought he brought on this other one. It was a, uh, a tire pump, like a a pneumatic pump with a digital display and yeah 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 tire pump you know you, you put it it shows you the the psi the pressure right yeah it shows um, the psi and that it. one as soon as it hit stock it just boom because it was the it was the it was the first private label one there was only there was a couple of other manufacturers uh slime i think it's quite well known in the usa mm-hmm. and there might have been another manufacturer that was that's like a household name but they weren't doing very well they didn't know what to do on amazon and optimize the platform and get you know yeah, knew how to rank the keyword it. and, and be, be discoverable yeah. on the platform so exactly. uh, so this uh so this um tire uh, inflator right this uh, the digital one that you guys you launched it together or did you launch it after, uh, before you came what was that dynamic there no, he, he'd already found it and it was mm-hmm. coming into stock mm-hmm. yeah so, so when that, you came in this uh, this was already an active product on the platform for him for steve no, it was just, yeah, it was active, yeah. It was just, it was just active. Part. Okay, so when you came in, what happened? What was the impact the moment you came in? What well, happened? Well, take what, us there. What I, what I did was spend a lot of time on all the, list, all the listings and the information and the pictures, the images, getting everything like much better than it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And how long did it take you? A few weeks, a few months, a few years? I don't know, just, just a couple of weeks. Couple of weeks, all right. And then what, sales uh, started booming or increasing? Or? Yeah, the, the sales of the the pressure gauge were, were consistent but the tire inflator that that thing just went straight out of stock just couldn't keep it in stock so we've got another back this this got another batch in this was just before christmas this batch landed and um and this is christmas of 2014 yeah yeah and and uh it didn't come into stock you know we, we, we were really panicking because it was the end of november in december well where, where the hell is it whether it was it was 100 and Hundred and ten thousand dollars worth of stock, you know. That's pretty heavy, and, yeah. And uh, just it didn't come to stock. Then Amazon said they'd lost it, couldn't find it. You're kidding. Couldn't find all the stock, and we're like, what? The? <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> so, could, could, couldn't find the stock, and uh, that, then they said, well, I think they said we'll we're gonna um, not what's the word I'm looking for? Not re reimburse you. Yeah, we're, we're going to reimburse you for the. I think I know something a little bit of something about reimbursements. I think yeah, I might yeah, know a little yeah. bit. Yeah. We're, we're going to reimburse you for all the stock we've lost, but we we have to wait until this date, and the date was the 29th of uh, December. Mm. So anyway, the 28th of December came. I still haven't found it. The 29th of December, we got an email from them saying they'd found all the stock. <laughs> they'd found all the stock. We were like, oh no. Wow. Are you, so we're, you, left, we're left with uh, a few thousand units. Uh, I think it was more so. You basically you're, you're expecting to get paid a, a, a lump sum reimbursements of a few hundred thousands of dollars. And we're left now. There was more than a few thousand. There was five or six thousand, I think. Mm. I think so what you got stuck like with it after the Christmas season? You kind of stuff. lost momentum. Yeah, well, we, yeah, we lost momentum. We, we dropped down the rankings, but it was easy to pick back up. But we just had a ridiculous amount of stock, and the the demand drops right off in January and February. So. What do we do? What Let's do do? send some to the UK. So we didn't uh-huh. know about the UK. So we've got a massive it cost of the fortune. To hold send. on, hold on. You're telling me you live in Newcastle, UK, and you didn't realize there's an Amazon UK? <laughs> yeah, we did, but we didn't know it was going to be as big. So we, so we sent it over to the UK, and then just immediately, as soon as it hit the stock, it immediately took off there as well. So now we had two. That's great. International, but, uh, yeah, doing uh, international uh, business. Sales, so, and then uh, that just that product just really took off, and we we fine tuned the listings even more and it became bestseller in the UK, bestseller in the USA um, for quite some time and really gave us a solid grounding. So then we just started to build new products on top of that in the automotive niche. Uh huh. So you create variations of the same product, maybe a few different colors or different uh, more uh, features 
or you created something no, like no, in no, the no. in the category just different types of tools and solutions yeah d- different types of tools like um uh jump leads uh extension cables uh multimeters testers um battery tester and how did you um do the market research what compelled you to create those products uh, as opposed to other ones is it data is it we more just, like no, your we, sense we, of uh we, your sense of create your your sense of creation yeah. we're just following the training from uh, asm the early asm really and as, as and then as things progressed, of course, we bought new training, new training. We always we invested thousands and thousands in so training. So you kept investing in your training slash education, yeah. right? You yeah. said, okay, the, it's, it's a hyper dynamic industry. You know, you need to keep building layers and layers of knowledge and keep yeah. up uh, okay. with, with, uh, with the data yeah. and what's going on. And that, you know, continue your success uh, along the platform, yeah? Yeah, absolutely essential. And we're going up to conferences in the USA and as well, um, Europe. Keeping That's great. That's great. Best. So it sounds like 2015, you head into the UK, you was, and then uh, what, 215, 216, 217, you're p- pretty much uh, setting up more layers and layers of yep. more Im- more products, more more yep. types of we listings, uh, based, uh, uh, based on data, based on you know marketplace data, where you know there's demand, you know you can fit the demand, there's mm-hmm. enough space for you to go in and optimize. Yeah, that's Got right. It. And went into Europe and Germany, France, Spain, Italy, which turned out to be a mistake later italy or the rest of them what was the mistake well the one in germany we thought was going to be big but uh in germany um we found out that the tire pumps in garages are all free so there wasn't really there wasn't really a demand for the what's free what's free what's free that when they go into a garage the tire pumps they use are all Ah, so when they uh, visit the car shop, basically uh, everything that they want to use is kind of free. They don't charge them. They don't upcharge them anything, so they don't have to buy the equipment and have it in yeah, the house. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was Germany. What was, what about Italy? Same thing or something else? Um, I don't know. Don't know what happened. Italy was okay, um, but there just wasn't the, the the they weren't willing to pay the amount of money for that product. They didn't see the value in it like they did in the UK and especially the USA. There's so much more value in it, so they paid a higher price. So the, the margin just went there. And we spent a lot of money with all the translations and uh, setting up, yeah, the, this marketplace on an international level. Yeah, yeah, uh, got it. Okay, so, so what happened next? Yeah, so we, we we got into a position in early 2017 where we were doing sort of about three, we'd done about three million dollars worth of uh, sales, and then sort of the, the trail in 12 months, and we thought it's time to sell the business. You thought or Steve thought, and it was you and him the whole time, yeah, or yeah, you already? We thought it's time to sell. We didn't know anything about selling the business, but we just thought let's get a quotation and 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 sell. So we got a quotation at that point, um, and it was you know worth what, two and a half million dollars, so on, on the region of that. But we thought, well, you know, we've got a business here. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. We have made a few mistakes, but we've, we've had more positives than negatives. And right. We've built it to four or five million and then we'll sell it right and that turned out to be a big big mistake um because in 2017 we had the europe thing that's what happened we realized we wasted you know you mean the brexit yeah no no not the brexit just the failure of the products in europe uh-huh, uh-huh got it yeah yeah so in germany and italy yeah yeah and yeah. um, we could have just concentrated more on the u.s market that's what we probably should have done um and then what happened at the same time was the, the Chinese sellers who were always there became savvy and clever at what they were doing. Yeah, the footprint one intensified at what, late uh, 2017, early 2018? It was probably about mid 2017. We noticed it, that they that they must have been trained, you know, the, the training and the knowledge got spread. Amazon, in. Amazon traded them. Amazon invested heavily. I was actually in China in 2017. I heard that, yeah. And everybody around was saying, yeah, Amazon's having all these conferences and meetings and it's just you know steering the 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 hay the fray uh, of of factories and Chinese sellers into the marketplace because mm-hmm. for Amazon and for them it's tremendous opportunity because Amazon wants selection at the best price. That's exactly what factories can give you. It gives you selection, abundance of selection at the best price. And if you just show them the ropes, they keep pumping uh, uh, more inventory into this machine, uh, no matter what the cost is. By the way, mm-hmm. uh, margins you know uh, they matter less. They got to keep these, the hands moving. So it's a different dynamics than. You know, an entrepreneur coming in, uh, you know, uh, and being uh, hyper focused on a product or two, when they just flush so many products in 
along the way kill you and all you know and, and, yeah. and the dozens of like you so it's a different dynamic completely uh, but that's okay there's just a natural progression of capitalism but uh, you're saying you had the opportunity to, to cash out the business for two and a half million back in 2017 you said you know let's keep rolling you know we think we were doing everything right but then you know Europe came to uh, you know the expansion in Europe um, you know backfired a little bit and then the Chinese uh, footprint became to uh, elbow you guys out uh, and what else happened yeah I guess kind of what happened is it had been so easy for us to set the business up in the first place you know that we it, you know doing it now would have been completely different it's a lot harder obviously but many of the techniques I suppose that are kind of learn our industry just went out the window because we just thought this is just so easy we just it was almost like not me too products but just branding the products you know finding a product sticking your brand and finding a product sticking your brand in it and that 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 was what the chinese were doing so we're basically having to fight against the chinese now our products weren't strong enough as they should have been right. and, and that's what may put us in a really weak position plus there was some quality issues went on at the time as well which were pretty bad the, the did have a big effect on us so if we, we panicked a bit and uh in about oof, mid to late 2017 we thought we better get a quote again and uh you know we're, we're panicking like it's probably not gonna be worth as much we knew it wasn't gonna be worth as much and the uh, broker said listen i don't think your business is in a saleable position wow you know, so the, from the, being two and a half million to basically NA, not available numbers were going south mm -hmm. so it wasn't a good business that, that we you know that we, we could have sold that point so we had, I had to pull things back together so you know I, I spent quite a long time uh, pulling things back together I had to get rid of um, some of the unprofitable products you know strike them out and, and turn the product the cut your losses on them yeah much leaner machine mm -hmm. yeah cut out lots of costs um, really buckle down um and then focus on the, the best quality pro products which i had and and that did work and uh then i also decided that we're going to have a proper exit strategy because uh, i'd learned a bit speaking in the brokers on you know on, in, in the two times that we put the quotes together and uh i decided to contact a couple more brokers and learn some stuff from them about and buyers and sellers of businesses as well. I had some friends that, that sold theirs and I just wanted to learn as much as possible about what it really takes to make a business uh, more saleable and to, to increase its value. And so I learned a lot of different things and a lot, lot, used a lot of tips and, and, and techniques to really increase value, increase the SDE uh, in, in the trail in 12 months. And you guys, it's a uh, seller discretionary earnings. Yeah, that's how so they that, kind of want it. There's, there's two ways to look at your business in terms of, uh, you know, your, your profits is EBITDA earning before interest taxation, uh, tax and taxes and amortization. Uh, but there's also SD where, you know, if you're owner of the business and you took a salary that can be removed and increase the EBITDA, uh, also known as SD. Am I correct? Yeah, no, yeah, it's essentially the net net profit plus the ad backs. The ad backs aren't just the on a salary. There are all kinds of things which you your salary, your commute, anything that kind of involves uh, other you yourself as an owner. Because once you remove from that position, there's not going to be that cost anymore. Or any, anything that was kind of a temporary or one-time thing, mm. maybe a lawyer fee for the for closing, uh, for doing an exit, or maybe the audit you did, or whatever was kind of technical or local. Maybe you did uh, one time you had to ship your product through air. Uh, you paid a premium, but that's not going to be the case going forward. So you can deduct that and. Add it to your SD. There's the sell discretionary earnings. In any case, so you learn all about that. Yeah, learn all about that, and then put the business back up for sale. And this was like 2000 and mid 2019 now. Um, all right. So it sounds like well, for a year and a half, or maybe a little bit more, you really picked it up together for the, yeah, that time frame of about. Sure uh, I had to really knuckle down and, and make some tough decisions in the business to. Right, all the nooks and crannies you did. You you cut the losers. You double down on the winners. You yeah. arrange all the books. You you set up all the procedures. All the all the grounds work to to set up uh, to, to be a healthy, sustainable business, and you yeah. do this in a course of what twelve to eighteen months. Yeah, launch launch some new products as well. Some and this time I used my um, design experience. So I thought, right, that's it. There's no way that's. There we go. I was yet. waiting for that. I was waiting <laughs> yeah. for that edge because if you just take from a factory, slap a label, okay, that you no, know, I I can do and David can do, but what what can I can David do that Yoni cannot do? As being a product and you know, being an engineer, you add a twist that. Nobody else can come in and yeah, so, that edge away. 
So I've got some products and I've got a, a special system for um, developing new unique ideas from products. Uh, it's like a, it's a whole, it's a huge worksheet, which was, which I've used in my past career for coming up with ideas and um, essentially beating the competition where they're weak. So I, so I came up with some re two really good ones and um, launched those and they did really well. Really Hold comfortable. on, so you're saying you threw all your mindset on the, on this, you know, this sheet, this uh, Google sheet or Excel sheet, okay, where you're able to identify Excel sheet and you're able to identify where you can really make an impact in a different than a certain product level? Yeah, it, essentially, essentially what you do is you analyze your strategic um, position against the competition in terms of features and benefits. Like how strong are you currently in terms of all, all the features? And of course, we were flat. We were basically following everyone else. There was no differentiation. Right. And then you work through a system of uh, three or four sheets. We're asking lots of different questions to draw out all kinds of information and ideas and look at the pain points and where they're weak. And essentially what you do is you drive in a strategic differentiation. Of, it's a graph and, and, you, and you can see that you're strategically different in these areas and that's where you're going to, win your battle and across those areas so that's what i did so then i had to go to china and uh work with the manufacturers to come up with the designs and uh unique those. designs owned by yeah. you nobody can, can really bend it or understand what's going on so you keep that competitive edge yeah yeah that's right that's great so you launched those and it uh hit success on well, the marketplace well, those, yeah they they were they worked well um that's great that's yeah and, so this is uh, 2018 and what else happened in 2018? 2018. Yeah, what else happened there? So you launched your product, you yeah, well, that, that was all the stuff I'd said, doubling down and cutting out the, the bad ones and pulling out of Europe and, and Canada. Then you put the uh, you went for a quotation again, you, you put the business on the shelf uh, to be sold yeah, again or went for quotation again in 2019. And that um during that process, I learned I learned absolutely more than what I probably did trying to trying to research it myself about what buyers really want to see in a business. And, uh, you know, that it went sold in uh, late 2019. So, so yeah. the stretch of more than two years, you built it right up and you built it the right way, product yeah. differentiated, launched properly. Yeah. Uh, all the fundamentals are in place. And uh, 2019, you were pretty, put it off for sale again. What was the quotation then? Yeah, I'd lost a million off the value. So it was one and a half. Uh huh. Got it. Okay, but at least from uh, basically from two million, two and a half million to NA, which is not applicable or not available, you know, you yeah. do a whole reset, and then two to nineteen, uh, one half million, and you you guys sold it. Yeah, sold it, sold it, and then um, you know, it was it was a good result. It could have been worse, but if we'd known, if I'd known what I know now, I would have sold it in two thousand and nine, at seventeen, straight away. I would have yeah, seen well, it. I think he did uh, put you in a position where you can, I guess, um, launch your next venture. And I guess mm -hmm. where maybe it's a point, maybe it's a time to jump into your next station. Yeah. So he successfully made it, a, you know, a seven figure exit. Uh, well, you and Steve together, right? And you build this together. And, and what was your next station? What would you do afterwards? Yeah, so the next, they decided we're going to build another brand. So this, this time in a completely different uh, niche in tools. And this obviously was going to be me designing some stuff. There you go, keep designing, <laughs> yeah, so, keep, keep the innovation design, going. Design it from the outset. So I spent a lot of time um, creating some new products in the tooling niche, um, doing the branding, getting the whole brand story right and really differentiating ourselves. Um, went out to China again. This was just before the five... I went out of China in the beginning of January, didn't know there was a virus there. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, visited the top three manufacturers, did full audits on them, um, and uh, chose the best one. And then that worked with them to finalize the designs. Yeah. So then, essentially, uh, you, you, you launched your second Amazon business, right? Hmm. And then uh, this is 2020 or earlier. Amazon last year. 20 now. No. And then what happened in 2020? Well, what happened there was I, had, I knew I had some time. The, the virus kicked off and I had some time and I thought to myself, what am I going to do? Because I've got some, I've got, it's going to be it's quite a long lead time because I had to design and do all the tooling and everything it was a lot, much longer order than what it would normally be. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself, well, I've learned so much you know, it, along the way of selling that business. And that I know that there's so many things that I've learned that in this new business, I'm doing completely differently. I'm now thinking about this new business 
in terms of what a buyer would want to see. Yeah, so if it's right from the start, right from day zero, I'm going to build it so for a maximum profit profitability. Right, when, to be optimized, you know, to be so whoever yeah. is the potential buyer, it's like a charm, it's like a glove fitting perfectly. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, well, obviously, then I didn't know that. That means pretty much every other Amazon seller won't know that because it's not in any of the training courses. All this stuff, it's not out there. It's really difficult to find, and most of it you have to learn as you go through the process yourself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this stuff together into a training program for Amazon sellers to give something back because over the years, all the conferences and people I've met, if it wasn't for all those people and training courses I've been on, I wouldn't have got where I was, where I am now. So I thought, let's give some back. So I decided to put this program together. I had a few months and uh, that's what I did. And I launched the, the, the beta version in April in 2020 and um that went really well yeah and you dubbed really, it if if uh amazon F fba uh, built to sell BTS. amazon F fba built to sell yeah fbts from the get-go that was the sell. name you dubbed it yeah you're building it to sell you're not just building an amazon business the way that you know that, that you're taught to do you, you're building it with the end game in mind so then that, that's the buyer taking it over that's great. So you launched in April, what, uh, to great success? Yeah, it was really, re went really well, the beta version. So That's there was, great. uh, got about quite a few people on the program straight away. And, and it, what I found was that many people are, are kind of stuck in a rut in the business and that some, many of them haven't even got it on the minds to sell. And the ones that do generally don't have a plan because they don't have a plan they're just kind of meandering scramble. around yeah, the and, scramble yeah the yeah. thread and and, and, yeah, some water. And, and, yeah. and the risk is what can happen is what happened to me is the product life cycle you go over the other side and uh, not realizing it and then suddenly your products become under threat because of the technology rising or the competition and that that's yeah you've got to be very very careful of that that's a trap it's a, a pitfall Got it. So you, the, the program is also able to analyze where the seller is in the life cycle of per, on the product level on each product. Yeah, well, well, not, not yeah. The, the, there's a there's a section about being mindful of that. Yeah, and making sure that you you're aware of market trends and what's happening in your niche. Because yeah, I think that's be that's amazing. If sellers are able to gauge where their product for each product, some might just have one, but some have a whole portfolio. On mm. each product level, you're able to identify in a very sober uh, matter uh, where you are, where you are in the life cycle of the product and what's the momentum, that'll be phenomenal. Cause then you can make honest decisions. If you know, it's about to end. Uh, so maybe you got to set up your business with another product that, you know, will catch uh, momentum that what's on the rise and there's potential earnings because anybody that's buying it will have that in mind. Right. I would assume yeah. anybody that's buying a business is buying it for years and years to come. So the products and the portfolio of the business needs to be always on the right momentum. And I think that's probably a key factor uh, of having that mindfulness uh, to build to sell. And then the more you can find products that have, I want to say, almost endless cycles or endless momentum, that will be probably the most optimized for, for having a sustainable business long term, which would uh, make anybody else, any entrepreneur or business or organization or brand ag aggregator interested in buying. Um, so that is also, also kind of a mission or ambition for the sellers to find those products that have strong, consistent demand. And uh, they have some sort of a moat uh, differentiator edge that will be sustainable for as many years uh, possible. So, uh, so you're saying these elements are are, are to be found in uh, FBTS? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it's, a, it's a seven module program, which is all geared towards giving sellers all the knowledge they need in order to build their business into the most saleable position and make it more valuable. And it all centers around gathering lots of information and understanding what you need to do in your business because each business has its unique very elements different, yeah sure yeah it can be very very different some businesses you know may benefit from working on a certain area where those might not um so you create a unique plan or coming back from my time in planning from other times so i've got lots of elements from my 20 years in industry built into this course it's amazing. you create a unique uh, exit plan and I know it's an exit plan, but that's exit plan. The sooner you put it together, the more uh, value you can drive into your business, especially with strategy-wise, yeah, strategic positioning. Uh, if if you do it in six months, yeah, you can 
yeah, add a lot of value, but I think 12 months is an absolute minimum because that's when you're in this train 12 months and you've got to really focus in on, on your numbers very, very closely. Got it. So 12 months is a good, uh, it's a good time frame to, to construct uh, everything together. So uh, the business is fully optimized. All right. So thank you so much for sharing so far. I want to kind of recap the body of the story, see if I got it all correctly, and then we'll head to the ending part of the, the episode. All right. So uh, born and raised in um, Newcastle, nor- Northern England, uh, close to the you know, border with uh, Scotland. Uh, you know, father and grandfather were engineers, uh, mostly in the, you know, the farm business. But uh, you uh, knew already in college you're going to take engineering, which you did. 1998, after uh, you already had a stint with this Drago company uh, doing an internship, you got a job right after college. Uh, you worked there, um, you know, mostly on uh, equipment for, uh, for underwater gear, right, for diving and, uh, and also for firefighting and stuff like that. Um, but uh, then you, uh, 2017, you moved to, um, to uh, SDM, sorry, SMD, SMD. right? SMD, and you, you work there also uh, uh, helping with uh, things also for underwater and especially the link the, the transatlantic cables and, and robots uh, that can go deep, deep underwater. Uh, once again, uh, throughout your, your career, you had your own patent, but your teams underneath you were very, very innovative in creating all these other patents and creating innovative products that you know we all rely on today, by the way, uh, that helps uh, everybody here to rely uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the technology uh, that's on the foundations of everything that you guys have uh, assisted on building. Uh, and then 2014, you know, it was cyclical with the industry of uh, the oil business, which you're kind of serving for the most part. You, you jump off a cliff, say, I'm, let's say I'm doing my own stuff alone. You always had that in mind. You know, by chance, you meet your buddy, Steve, who knocks on your door saying, hey, I took this ASM course. Here's my keys to enter the Amazon Sell Essential account in the U.S., which sucks you right into uh, the world of e-commerce. Um, and since 2014 until today, you put your full might into it. You uh, you had the opportunity to launch new products, refine products, improve products, put the company up for sale, thing you can do yourself. Uh, then, uh, you know, the next time you put a quotation, it didn't end up well. So it made you basically uh, pivot and understand even more the elements that are needed to, to create a successful Amazon uh, a business that is fit, fit for sale. So you, so you give it a second run and lo and behold, you did it. You brought it back to life. You made a successful exit. You got paid for it. Now, you, uh, now you're focused on two things. All right. This is uh, you're focused on setting up your second Amazon uh, business, right? The private label brand, uh, learning from all your experience and doing it the right way. In addition to that, contributing back to the community because you did it successfully. You, you're going to do it successfully again, hopefully soon. Um, shares all of that experience, all that ability with the, with the others, with if, um, FBTS uh, and, and have it as a vessel and tool and, and a program for the sellers to be able to do things successfully and learn from your pain and all your cuts and bruises. Uh, so far, we got it correctly. Yeah, that's all good. Uh, fantastic. So thank you so much for sharing uh, that. It's fascinating. All right. So uh, I want two more things from you, right? The first thing, if somebody wants to connect and learn more about you, where they can find you. And the last thing will be is what is your message of hope and inspiration for entrepreneurs listening? Mm-hmm. Probably the best place to find me will be uh, my email. Just send me an email. I'm happy to add ask any answer any questions anyone's got what's, what's the address anyone? yeah you, you can give it the address we'll make sure to have uh, written on the screen uh, once yeah, we so publish it's so dave d-a-v-e underscore story s-t-o-r-e-y at a-f-b-t-s dot com got it you got it all right so anybody who wants uh, to reach out just email directly and what's your message of hope and inspiration right I can I understand what it was like being an Amazon seller, not having sold a business before. It's kind of you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, you might think you know, you're going on d- down the right path and be able to produce the most valuable business, but I can guarantee you the things that I've learned that you will need to know in order to do that. So don't get don't fall into that trap. And the second one is start with the end in mind. So if you haven't got your selling goal. Okay, whether it's 1 million, whether it's 10 million, whether it's 100 million, you haven't got your selling goal and your time scale frame and you haven't got a plan on exactly how to get there, then the chances are that either one, you're not going to get there at all, or two, if you do get there, it's going to take a lot longer and it's going to be a much more winding road. So start with the end in mind, make sure you've got that plan, that exit plan, and you know exactly where you're going and what to do to get there. Got it. Have yeah, it's about, I, I like that. Have the ending in mind. So any story that you're in, whatever your story is right now in e-commerce, have the ending in mind. And of course, AFBTS is uh, there for you to help. Um, so tap, make sure to tap into that. Beautiful, All right, David? Thank you so much. I hope everybody else enjoyed. Uh, stay safe and healthy, everybody. Till next time. Thanks, Ryan.